North East India is one of the world's greatest biodiversity hotspots. The region, which is at the confluence of the Indian, Malayan, and Indo-Chinese biogeographical realms, is blessed with one of the most beautiful landscapes of India. The rich Brahmaputra floodplains and the eastern Himalayan foothills makes the region a hotspot for large populations of elephants, rhinos, water buffalo, gaur, parasinga, wild boar, hog, deer, and cheetah deer. Kazuranga National Park also has one of the highest densities of taiga in the world. The region is home to 10 species of wild cats, including cloud leopards, snow leopards, and Asiatic golden cat. The region also has 15 species of non-human primates. Unfortunately, the biodiversity of the region faces numerous threats, including the illegal wildlife trade, deforestation, and dams. One organization who, which is spearheading conservation efforts in the region is Aryanak. In this episode, I interview the founder, Vipa Kumar Talukdar, about his journey as a conservationist. We talk about various projects of Aryanak and his work with rhino conservation. Tune in and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you are listening to. For those who decide to support the podcast through optional paid subscription on YouTube or Substack, 30% of the revenue from this episode will be donated to Ariana to help support their work. So welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on today here. Thank you so much. What got you interested in wildlife conservation and specifically rhinos? Well, I had, you know, during my bachelor degrees, I had geology, botany. So I got, you know, some of the topics in my syllabus, including some species like golden langur or pygmy hog, on which nothing much information were available. So that led me to be in touch with forest wildlife officials. And then, you know, in 1989, so I started the NGO called Aranyak. Of course, initially, you know, we were mainly involved with the birding. But the reason why I, you know, started devoting more time for rhino conservation is because of the increased poaching during that time. And I basically thought how best I could help in order to check, you know, the rhino poaching and strengthen the overall conservations. So you, you mentioned Aryanak. What is the idea behind this organization and what is your long-term vision? Well, the idea, initial idea was to, you know, inculcate in the minds of young people love for wildlife. So that was the initial, you know, I means motive of setting up these organizations. Initially, Aranak was set up as a nature club. But then, you know, as we grow, our programs, you know, increase and diversify. So we, you know, deleted Nature Club and mainly now focusing on applied research and conservation so as to help the management. So long-term goal is basically, you know, to help conserve the important ecosystems in the Eastern Himalayas and also build local capacity, the young forces to carry it forward. During your PhD, you studied the status of Anitite, which are water birds in Assam. What were the prominent findings of your research? Well, that's what we found during that time, you know, the about 36 species were earlier recorded in, in, in Assam. During my, you know, study, we have found that some of the species are no longer found. Some of them, of course, are migratory. So maybe there are some problems with the migratory part. One of the species which got extinct, you know, is the pink-headed duck. So there's no recent record. So, and my emphasis was also to, you know, get more information on the white-winged wood duck. So, and so one of my chapter is the white-winged wood duck, which has ultimately become the state bird of Assam. And I also advocated for that, you know, to be included as state bird of Assam with the state governments after doing my PhD. So overall, you know, basically to find out, you know, the, the spread of the NRTD in different locations in Assam 
and also to find out basically you know what is the status of our residential ducts of which the white wood duct was most important so the white winged wood duck is classified as critically endangered. So what are the primary threats to the species and where can they be found? And what can be done for their conservation? See, the species, you know, also have a subspecies, but let me concentrate only on species, you know. The, the, the white wood duck is basically found in the South and Southeast Asia. In India, it's mainly recorded from Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. There are, you know, some records from Indonesia and Malaysia as well. So its wall population will be probably around, you know, around 1,000. And in Assam and, and Arunachal Pradesh, its populations will be about 300, 350. Okay. They are basically a cavity nesting duck. So they need big trees. And because, you know, in certain areas, the, you know, the, the big trees are being cut, you know, deforestations are taking place. So they are having issues with, you know, finding suitable, you know, nesting sites. The second threat which I found is also, you know, the chemicals being used in, you know, in near the habitats. It could be tea gardens, it could be other, you know, factories. So that has also impacted, you know, the whiting wood duck. Basically, the eggshell, you know, is becoming thinner. So sometimes, you know, when the whiting wood ducks, you know, started, you know, means the hand started, Sitting over the eggs, eggs breaks down. So these are some of the issues. Of course, you know there may be some collections of the eggs and ducklings from from the habitat. But generally, you know, killing at such is not that much a problem. It's mainly the habitat. So every year, various parts of Assam faces severe flooding during the monsoon. Why are these floods so important for the ecosystems of national parks such as Kaziranga? And what impact does this have on the wildlife? Our rhino bearing areas, including Kaziranga, are in the floodplain ecosystem. That means they are very you know, close to river Brahmaputra. And for that, you know, the habitat requires you know, annual flooding in order to energize the ecosystem, the grassland and wetland ecosystems, and also take out, you know, the, some of the, you know, water, like water hyacinth, you know, which, which accumulates in, in some of the wetlands. So, you know, the, the rhinos and most of the herbivores in that floodplain ecosystems needs good grasslands patches, good water bodies. And that is something, you know, the, the annual flood is very important because this is also, you know, in one, one way, this is also only the natural factor that can also, you know, check the population growth of many species naturally. Okay, so this is something like selection, you know, natural selection process. So flood sometimes takes away, you know, the lives of some wildlife. But if we see it, it's mainly basically the weaker animals. So the, you know, the stronger progeny remains, the weaker progenies are taken away by nature. So once upon a time, the Indian rhino was heading towards extinction. What led to this massive collapse in their population? And, and over the last few decades, the population has revived significantly. So first, what, what led to their decline and what has India done well to revive the species? Well, I think, you know, the effort to conserve while, you know, the rhinos are there in the, in the you know, at least two, you know, rhino bearing states, because that's the Assam and West Bengal, where, you know, the rhinos have been there for a long time. From other areas, rhinos has been exp exterminated. So I think both Assam and the West Bengal government had taken timely actions of over 100 years ago to conserve the sites and also to protect the, the, the rhinos. The rhinos are always a protecting dependent species because of its you know, pressure from the illegal wildlife traffickers for its horn. So I think over the years, the protection has been enhanced. The engagement of communities to you know, conserve the rhinos have been further you know, strengthened. The people in, in, in Assam and also in West Bengal where rhinos are found are also feeling proud. 
So these are the factors, you know, that has led to the increase of rhino populations in, in over over hundred years. And today, you know, I think the greater one horn rhino overall population in India, and Nepal, is four thousand fourteen, out of which you know about three thousand two hundred, you know, are found in 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 India. Assam is, of course, having the largest number of the greater one horn rhino. And then in West Bengal also, you know, there are two national parks, Gurumara and Jalapara is also having over about 300, you know, rhino population. Dudhua in Uttar Pradesh are also having about 46 rhinos at this moment. I do know that, that, that Dudhua had rhinos, so that's something I learned. That's right. So what do you think are the next steps for rhino conservation in India? Is poaching still a major threat? As I said, you know, poaching will always remain a major threat. But, you know, if I see, you know, the situation in Assam over the years, Assam government has enhanced, you know, the, the, the protection, you know, cover. The special task force of Assam police has been engaged to check rhino poaching. Then the frontline staff strength in places like Kaziranga and other rhino bearing areas are also being, en also being enhanced. So from protections, you know, arrangement, I think there are good progress, you know, that has been initiated by the government. That has led to reduction of rhino poaching, say, from in 2013, the Sam lost 41 rhinos. In past two years, at an average, we are losing, losing, you know, two. So there's a huge success, you know, from 41 to coming down to the two. So I think poaching is definitely one of the threats. But other emerging threat is also, you know, the in invasions by alien plant species in grassland ecosystems. So that also needs to be taken care of because otherwise if we lose habitat, prime habitat, to accommodate the growing number of rhino population will be a challenge. So along with protection, I think the habitat management has to be prioritized and, you know, the resources has to be put in in order to improve and maintain you know, the, the optimum habitat conditions that will enable rhinos to grow more, you know, and also other herbivores to, go to, to increase the population. Historically, India had all three species of Asiatic rhinos, including the Sumatran and Java rhinos. Where were these two rhinos found historically in India? Well, you know, means uh, if we see the history, Javan Sumatran rhinos, uh, you know, as you mentioned, were also recorded mainly from the northeastern part. There are there were some records of Javan rhinos, you know, in Sundarban, Kuch Bihar, that area. The Sumatran rhino, I think, the last you know records was from Mizoram during 1950s. After that, you know, there has been no records, authentic records of these two species, you know, in India. Maybe because of the habitat, you know, destructions would be the major, major cause. And these two species are a little bit different, you know, because they, especially the Sumatran rhino, you know, they, they generally need forested habitations, including the Javan rhino. So I think mainly because of the habitat, you know, deteriorations, we may have lost these two species, along with poaching probably during, during those times. Do you think it would be ever possible to reintroduce these two species to India? Uh, well, before that, I think, you know, habitat has to be, you know, rechecked whether the habitat is still suitable. Second challenge will be who will give the rhinos. <laughs> because now it is only found in Indonesia and so tiny populations, you know, so the Javan rhino used to be 76 as per the estimations, but, you know, just recently, the Indonesian police has investigated and they found 26 rhinos, Javan rhinos were killed. That means 76 minus 26 is about 50 rhinos left at this moment. Sumatran rhino also, you know, the population is around 34 to 47. So the question is, you know, you know, the, I mean, who will give the rhinos? But I think now at, at this moment, to secure the Javan and Sumatran rhino, Indonesian governments need to take time-bound action to protect them from further poaching. Losing 26 Javan rhino out of 76 doesn't give a very good hope.
if the Indonesian government you know, initiates, I am hopeful that you know, they'll be able to secure the remaining population of critically endangered Javan and Sumatran rhino. I think we had a similar issue with that with the cheetah reintroduction where Iran only had about less than 100 cheetahs, so we cannot right. solve the populations from there. You also look after the Asian Rhino program of the Iran International Rhino Foundation. Talk about this program a bit. Right. Well, I joined International Rhino Foundations in 2008, initially as their Asia coordinator. In last years, I am basically, you know, acting as the senior advisor for Asian Rhinos, helping International Rhino Foundations to shape, you know, the conservation you know, projects or the, the support that has to be provided to secure the three species of Asian Rhinos. For the audience, I would like to intimate that in Asia, we have three species of Asian Rhinos. The Greater One Horn Rhino, which is a vulnerable species as per the IUCN Red List. The Javan and Sumatran rhinos are critically endangered species as per the IUCN Red List. So my role is basically, you know, to work with the ranch country governments, other conservation agencies, and also with, with my team at IRF in Asia to, to secure, you know, the, the, the rhinos. For Sumatran rhinos, there's a conservation breeding program going on in Indonesia where, you know, a few bats of calves has been you know, successfully raised. So I, I, I do visit Indonesia, you know, annually, three, four times, and work with, the, with their governments and also with the rhino conservation organizations in Asia. Aryanuk is also working extensively to mitigate human-elephant conflict. So one of the innovative solutions used by your organizations is a plantation of king chili and lemons. How do these plantations mitigate human elephant conflict? Well, this is basically you know, a process through which we are trying to help the villagers. The, these are the elephant deterrent plant, which also provides you know, the, the income to the people. So elephants generally damages you know, the crop fields and also sugar cans. So we need to avoid those, you know, in, in the vicinity of elephant habitat. So we have started working with the with the villagers in, in some parts of Assam, basically to improve their livelihood and also to protect, you know, their crop fields. So sometimes we put, you know, the the lemon as a fence, as a biofence. The chili also works as a you know as a, as a good deterrent. Then if once the biofence is done, you know. Within that biofence, they can also grow some other crops. But lemon is 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 having good market value, and so is chili. You know, so people are getting benefited, you know, from from these kind of interventions. Talk about some of the alternative livelihood projects which Aryanak supports. Well, we you know like the weavings uh, we have provided in Assa. In any functions, you know, we felicitate people with gamusa. Okay, we so gamusa earlier was only having flowers. So what we have started, we have started in gamusa, you know, inserting wild animals, rhino, elephants, gibbons, and thereby, you know, increasing its market value. And also through this traditional weaving, we are trying to, you know, create conservation awareness. So weaving is one of them in in Assam. You know, there are a lot of traditional weaving. Some of them are very colorful people, you know, there are, there are demands. Then we also engage the ladies, especially the women's around Manas National Park to get engaged in like, you know, the, 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 the making juice, the pickle and other, you know, that kind of activities. We also, you know, provide training for organic farming using vermicompost. We also, you know, help them with the poultry, you know, so that they can increase their 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 livelihood. So these these are some of the you know interventions that we are you know we are you know involved in in basically to help the local villages you know to improve their 
economy and at the same time, you know, seeking their support for conservations. Because see, we are a conservation organization. We are not a direct rural development agency. So whenever we work with the communities, we make it very clear that we'll help you in diversify your livelihood options through training and through some support. But you also need to help us to help save wild animals. Arenax Legal and Advisory Division runs the Wildlife Crime Monitoring Project. Talk about this project and the Tether Initiative. Okay, so this uh, you know Wildlife Crime Monitoring Project has been in function for a long time. We started it, I think, in 1997. Initially, we were you know doing a lot of you know wildlife legal orientation program for forest guards which we are still continuing. So that basically helps the forest guard to understand how best they can use the Wildlife Protection Act or Forest Conservation Act to, you know, to frame the cases so that the culprits are convicted. So, you know, a few lawyers help us a lot. One of the lawyers I would have, I would like to name is Led Goto Mujir. He was an advocate who helped us for a long time. He died a few years ago, but, you know, he was instrumental in, in carrying out, you know, a lot of our legal orientation program. And uh, now in, in past four or five years, we are focusing the legal orientation program for police and other paramilitary forces, including the border agencies like BSF, SSB, CISF, and ITBP. With CISF, we have also, you know, done programs in Guwahati Airport because they are in charge of protections and extra machines and all other things with the other airline staffs, basically so that they can detect, you know, the illegal smuggling of wildlife products through airports. So we are getting tremendous support from these agencies. You know, sometimes they request us to continue this kind of training program. So we feel that, you know, the, the diversifying our legal orientation program beyond forest guard and forest staff are giving, you know, good results. We are also doing legal orientations, you know, workshops with the judicial officials in collaboration with the Assam State Legal Service Authorities, Manipur State Legal Service Authorities, Mizoram State Legal Service Authorities, you know, through which we are also, you know, sharing the information on wild animals and the importance of, you know, taking wildlife offenses seriously because it is related to, you know, national security. Because there are investigations that has taken place in past, you know, few years, which has revealed that, you know, rhino horns are exchanged across the border in lieu of illegal arms. So if illegal arms comes into India, it is, you know, going to destabilize the country. So this kind of, you know, awareness and knowledge sharing programs with the enforcement agencies and judicial officials has also helped them to prioritize that, you know, the wildlife cases are important. And Assam has already set up a few fast-track courts for, to deal with the, you know, wildlife cases. So nowadays, these fast-track courts, you know, settles these kind of cases in a span of, you know, one to two years' time. Earlier, these cases last for 20 years, 25 years. What are some of the other species which Ariana works with? Could you just briefly elaborate upon some of the most exciting projects you guys are working on right now? Okay, so we have, you know, some specific divisions within Arayana. So, you know, the, like the Rhino Research and Conservation Divisions, Elephant Research and Conservation Divisions, the Gangetic Dolphin Research and Conservation Divisions, AB Fauna Research and Conservation Division, Harpeto Fauna Research and Conservation Divisions. So Harpeto Fauna is basically, you know, snakes, amphibians, reptiles and amphibians. We have primates research and conservation divisions. So these are some of the you know, species-based divisions. And then we have other divisions like conservation education, capacity building, legal and advocacy I have already mentioned. We have a wildlife genetics division that deals with DNA-based work. And I know that, that particular divisions through the wildlife genetics lab, we are also providing you know, the forensic support to wildlife cases in Assam. So, you know, we, we provide reports on, the, on, on wildlife offenses whenever police or forest officials ask for. We also have a remote sensing and GIS divisions, you know, which is involved in monitoring 
the land cover land use changes and making good maps of you know on wildlife areas we also have a community and livelihood divisions that works you know exclusively with the communities so we and we also have a pygmy hawk you know threatened species you know recovery program which includes the conservation breeding of the critically endangered now it has become endangered of course the the pygmy hog you know which which is with good success in in terms of the breeding and release it back into the wild so obviously the most famous park of assam is kaziranga but assam is probably one of the most biodiverse regions of the country if not the entire south asian region which which place would you recommend visiting beyond kaziranga to see wildlife for a, for a tourist who is coming outside assam i would definitely suggest visiting manas because the beauty of manas is you know is different you may not see that many animals as probably as probably people used to see in in kaziranga but manas gives a, a different flavor okay because it is in the foothills so i would definitely suggest going to manas if people are having less amount of time and they are near guwahati they can visit pobitora which is one hour drive that is the highest density of rhinos are found you know some small 16 square kilometer area where we have over 107 rhinos so which are very near to 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 guwahati city so and and for birding you know if people are interested in birding you know in assam many places including the namari national park is very good for birding dibrusekwa national park the the hingpatkai you know wildlife sanctuary is all the national park is also very important raimona is another national park which has so there are varieties you know it depends on the taste of the of the tourist but i i would definitely suggest you know to visit manas national park because that is something i feel you know is a unique place this because both manas and kaziranga is a wall heritage site you know but people prefer going to kaziranga because they can see more animals but i think along with the animals you know the, enjoying the scenic beauty the terrain is also very important to to be appreciated I went to Manas in 2019 and I loved it. Okay. Even even we went to the Bhutan side the Greater Manas National Park and it was so nice. Right. So what have been some of the most prominent challenges you have faced during your conservation career? Well, you know the challenges is of course, you know, for organizations like us is to ensure the sustainable funding. because you know in conservation funds are essential you know without fund we are only doing conservation not conservation so i think that you know sustainable funding is essential for which is a challenge but it is also an opportunity for us to look for you know the funding fortunately you know our supporters and donors have been supporting us for a long time one of our you know supporters have been supporting us since 1994 So that's the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation based in UK, you know. So it's almost thirty years now they have been supporting. So that gives us some sort of confidence that definitely we are delivering, and that is why we have been able to keep the faith of you know the donors. So and then you know challenges are also because you know in certain parts the destructions, the deterioration of habitats are there. the human wildlife interactions in terms of you know leading to conflict is a major challenge that we are trying to you know intervene in order to reduce it getting quality people to work is also a challenge sometimes we have funding we may not have a good people to to work with so that is why we have started in a lot of capacity building training programs we have started volunteer programs we have started internship program so that you know the young people can work with us they get to know how we work and we also get to know which are these people volunteers and interns that we could probably think of recruiting you know because nowadays just looking at the at the at the cv it doesn't help much because you know with the ai and all other things the cvs are becoming so good but you know when a person has been put into the field we get to know the actual caliber okay because wildlife conservation wildlife management we have to do more in the field you know the boots on the grounds are very essential okay so that is where i think i feel there are a lot of opportunities are there and for students and researchers if they are viewing this program 
I would like to encourage them to come forward. There are unlimited opportunities to work in this field, especially in Northeast, because it's a biodiversity hotspot area. If in this region we cannot create, you know, employment, you know, having so much biodiversity, then where we will create? So a lot of opportunities are there to help, you know, conserve the natural resources and biodiversity that will ensure a better human well-being. Okay, so whatever we do in conservation needs to be related to the human well-being. And that is what exactly we are trying to do. We are you know, trying to conserve wildlife or, or the habitat, not for ourselves, but to improve the human well-being in order to reduce the catastrophic effect, like increase of temperatures, you know, other natural, natural calamities that has been you know, witnessed more and more of late. And what have been some? I mean, sorry, I'll repeat that. What have been some of your most memorable memorable moments from your conservation career? Well, the, I think you know the memorable moments. Whenever we get you know whatever the interventions we put, give successes. Initially, in nineteen eighty nine, soon after you know the formations of RINOC, we filed our first public interest litigations, challenging. The decision of the, of the state government during that time to lease out fisheries inside the Dibrusukwa Wildlife Sanctuary. During that time, Dibrusukwa was a wildlife sanctuary and the white wing wood duck was there. So we filed a public interest litigation, which has forced government to withdraw that decisions. Then we also filed another public interest litigation in 1993, challenging the decisions to de reserve reserve forests in Assam. So Guwahati High Court in 2000 has given landmark judgment that no reserve for us can be de-reserved. Okay, so these are the steps that has helped us, you know, to, to, to protect the sanctity of forest. I think building the local capacity of young people. Now we are having almost 194 work staff working with, with, with RINOC. I think that itself is a contribution building local capacity, you know. And some of our, you know, colleagues have already you know, been able to make inroads to national and international area through their conservation, you know, interventions and quality work. So that those are very important. And I am very happy whenever my colleagues are rewarded or they are acknowledged for their contributions. So that I feel that, you know, that is something that our organization has given a platform for everyone not only to promote the organizations, but also to promote himself or herself through doing quality work in order to conserve wildlife and wildlife habitat. So that was the final question I had for you today. Thank you so much for taking time out for this. Thank you so much for your time too. We have reached the end of this episode of the, of the Think Wildlife Podcast. If you are still listening, thank you. And I hope you enjoyed this podcast and learned something new about conservation. Feel free to leave your thoughts on the episode. And don't forget to share and subscribe. Before we end the podcast, I would like to share another podcast on Indian wildlife called The Thing About Wildlife by Ishika Ramakrishna. Also for those who would like to learn more about conservation in India, I have attached a link to three books on Indian wildlife, which I highly recommend. One is a field guide to the mammals of India by Vivek Menon, which is by far one of the most detailed field guides I have seen from anywhere in the world. The second is titled At the Feet of Living Things, written by the various conservationists at the Nature Conservation Foundation. It covers 25 years of the organization's research ranging from the conservation of snow leopards in Spiti Valley to rainforest restoration in Anamalai and Dugong conservation in the Anaman and Nicobar Islands. The final is a four-part series by Mr. H.S. Pabla, a former Indian Forest Service officer which provides a very in-depth analysis of the state of India's conservation and the for way forward. It covers species reintroduction, wildlife, tourism, the forest fights, and poaching. He also talks about his time as an officer 
heading various conservation projects in Madhya Pradesh, ranging from the reintroduction of Parasinga and Black Park to the Gore and tackling the Panna coaching crisis. And with that, we end this episode of Think Wildlife Podcast. Thank you once again.